I'm um, doing it with uh, slides, um, and uh, this has the, the tendency to go a little fast, so there's one trick. You just ask a lot of questions. <laughs> the lectures are constructed in such a way that, I mean, I can easily stretch or uh, compress in, in the second lecture specifically. So let's just relax and we, we see how far we get. It will just depend on you. If you ask zero questions, I guess I make it through. If you ask many questions, then I will compress and that's just fine. On content, yeah, we'll just leave away stuff. Okay, so um, we will discuss here um, driven open quantum systems, yeah, which uh, on the microscopic level violate uh, thermodynamic equilibrium conditions and we will ask what happens if we uh, morph from this microscopic scale to asymptotic many body uh, scale. So this here is the outline in uh, the first two lectures. Uh, I will give you the theoretical background. I will tell you how we can describe such systems which are microscopically driven and open and we want to understand what their many body physics is. So the main tool that I will introduce here is a, a Keldish a functional integral where we start, the starting point is a Lindblad master equation, which we'll also go through, but rather quickly. Anyways, I again say if you have questions there, we can pass the first lecture on that. Um, and then I uh, will uh, map this into a Keldish path integral, so that's really a small point, looks a small point here, but it will probably take today's lecture. And uh, tomorrow, I will then uh, do a few more um, formal developments connecting, for example, this Keldish path integral to what is known as Langevin equation, if you've heard about that. I will specifically pay attention to the question how we can actually quantify the presence, the breaking of equilibrium conditions, including in stationary states. So it will not be about time evolution, but stationary non-equilibrium steady states. And as applications, we'll discuss um, phases and phase transitions then in, in these systems, specifically in two-dimensional systems uh, from, from semiconductors called exciton polariton systems that, that will do so. That, that's mainly a lecture two then, these, these four bigger points here. And then in the last lecture, I want to um, use this uh, Keldish technology to discuss a topic that uh, you've just heard in the lectures by Sun Wong uh, on uh, measurement-induced phase transitions. We'll focus there on a specific uh, fermionic problem. I uh, will have to explain you a bit a weak continuous measurement concept as opposed to the strong projective that you've already discussed. This is a limit of measurements which lends itself ideally to a Keldish functional integral techniques and I will introduce all the tools that we need in particular as replica construction um, to extract uh, the, the many body physics in these measurement induced uh, phase transitions from an analytical path integral approach. Okay, so let's start here. Lindblad uh, quantum master equation with the uh, idea that I first uh, explain the microscopic physics and then kind of gradually we zoom out and on the way we get to this Keldish. Very basic, what is a driven open quantum system? Well, it's depicted here. So the quantum system is in here and the specific, there's two uh, important um, notions that we have to appreciate here. First of all, it's an open system, yeah? so this is immersed and coupled to an environment which conceptually is much, much bigger than the system itself. There are infinitely many more degrees of freedom as the system, and um, this is what makes the system open here. And then the second crucial feature is that the system is, in addition, driven by external fields. Yeah? So Many systems are open, phonon, bars, and condensed matter, but these systems we have in mind here, they're in, in addition driven by um, external forces like a laser, and this is actually the combination that breaks the conditions of thermodynamic equilibrium. Here is a simple example for that. We have here uh, the, the paradigmatic situation from quantum optics, that's really where these driven open systems originally come from. We have a ground state, we have an excited state, we forget about all the other possible levels of this atom. And then um, there is a distance, an energy distance between these levels, between these two black lines here. 
and uh, we drive the system with a laser of intensity omega, the Rabi frequency interpolating between these two transitions, and the driving frequency almost bridges us up to the upper level. Yeah? So, and this is uh, the, the, the remaining uh, energy distance is this detuning delta. Okay, and so this is the aspect that makes the system driven. And now it is also an open system because this atom, yeah, when we have it here in free space, it's just coupled to um, the environment of the radiation field, photon field. And this allows for the effect of spontaneous emission at a rate kappa. So this is super simple, but one thing you should notice, and that's really a crucial point, yeah, so drive in this problem here is absolutely essential to get a non-trivial dynamics even going. Yeah? Imagine I, I put off this omega, yeah? so, and, so I don't bridge uh, energetically to the upper level, then this system will remain in its ground state forever. There's, of course, a little temperature from the environment, yeah, but that will never be enough to um, non-exponentially small uh, occupy this upper level. Yeah. And, um, so we need the drive to get an interesting dynamics in this small system here. And also there is important implications yeah, of the presence of this drive, physical implications. And I would ask you yeah, to store these implications and we'll, we'll encounter them, including in the many body context in these lectures over and over again. For example, there is no concept of minimizing the energy in this system. Yeah? So minimizing the energy would really mean I stay down there this is gone in the moment you start driving the system. There's also no guarantee for this idea of detailed balance, and I, I understand that usually this does not resonate very well with students. What is, again, detailed balance? Well, that is just a statement that two states in the system, say this upper and the lower level, are connected by um, probabilities of going between these levels governed by nothing else but the energetic distance between these levels. And without going more into detail, you can see that this cannot be the case here. Yeah? So the, the energy distance would be just the distance between these two black lines, and there's many more scales in this problem. Yeah? So there's this, in particular, there's this new, the driving frequencies, there's the driving intensity, and there's this kappa scale, many more scales that that just doesn't work to think that there would be only these two scales, yeah, the distance between the energy levels in the problem. So detailed balance is violated in the moment that you switch on some drive and, and you operate a system like Why that. Why do you need the detuning fields here? Yep. Is the driving frequency enough? We can, we can uh, even tune the detuning if we like, yeah, if we have the capability to tune the laser frequency. We can also change the detuning. It's just a parameter to, to show you what, what the parameters of the problem. Can be positive, can be negative, it can be on resonance when it's zero. So it, I'm just saying one point is crucial. Yeah? The distance between these levels is huge. Yeah? And the detuning is a quantity that's typically on the order of the energy scale omega, on the order of kappa. And so these scales are in the same range, but the distance, with, this is the biggest scale in the problem. Yeah? And if without, this bridging, we'd never reach it. That's the point. Yeah? So it's energy scale separation. Another point that's maybe not that prominent and visible in this problem here is that um, in such a system, in such a driven open system, there is no guarantee or there's no need to obey the second law of thermodynamics for the small subsystem. Of course, the total system and environment, yeah, that will uh, always have show entropy growth, but I mean, think of a fridge at home, yeah? so this is a classical driven open system where we can transfer entropy from the small subsystem in the inside of this fridge to the outside of the world. And that also works in, in quantum systems in principle. Okay, now how do we describe um, these systems here quite in general? That's this uh, beast here. Um, and let's go through all the terms uh, one by one. So the interest now, as I was saying, is the time evolution of the density matrix, but now we have to qualify it's the density matrix of the system. Yeah? And what generates the dynamics, what generates the temporal change of this uh, system density matrix? The first piece should be familiar, 
should be really familiar. This is the Heisenberg von Neumann equation, if we forget about this other bulky stuff. This is really a way of writing the evolution of, of quantum mechanical system uh, for density matrices instead of um, state vectors. So this is the coherent evolution. And then come this bulky piece here. You get to know, no, no worries, we, we'll spend some time on that. But here I'm just describing, I'm introducing what, what, what is uh, going on here or what, what are the, the, the terminology. These guys here, these L's, they describe roughly how the system couples to the outer world. They are called Lindblad operators. And this index I that it carries here, that's just a placeholder for degrees of freedom. It could be, for example, a lattice site. If you have a lattice and it's coupled somehow to the environment, every lattice site, so then it will carry an index I. The index I can also be a spin degree of freedom. Yeah, so it, it can label all kinds of degrees of freedom that we might think of. And then this entire thing, yeah, so this combination of coherent and driven dissipative evolution, this is what is called this Lindbladian, or another word is also Liouvillian. Yeah, Liouvillian that comes from probability conservation, and an analogy from classical phase-based dynamics, which is also Liouville dynamics in the sense of probability conserving dynamics. Okay, so how can we actually derive this equation? Yeah? And there's two structural ways how you can do that. Yeah? One is very good if you like to know how good are my approximations. Of course, this is, as anything in physics, this is kind of an approximation. And um, if you want to go that way, you do a second order time dependent perturbation theory approach for an, a, a microscopic model yeah, which has here this H, the system Hamiltonian, it shows also shows up here, and then explicitly models the bath yeah, as a system. The bath is here has the feature that it has infinitely many more degrees of freedom as the system. Yeah? So that gives you a notion: the bath won't won't change, but the system can change can change being coupled to the bath. And then the bath system bath coupling. How are they coupled? That's really where these Lindblad operators L occur. Yeah, so, and they are coupled linearly to the um, bath operator. So this L can be any polynomial, if you wish, of system operators, of the system operators, but it is linear in this bath at degrees of freedom. And the bath Hamiltonian itself, we take it also in a simple way of modeling this as a really as a um, continuous collection of harmonic oscillators. Yeah? So this mu here, you can see, I, I wrote it as a sum, but you may think of it really as a continuous, as an integration over a continuum of these degrees of freedom. This is this condition that we have here, infinitely many more modes in the bath um, than in the system. Okay, and then there's three approximations that would be a lecture in its own right to go through them in, in detail, but just that you know the main ingredients. So these are what is called Born approximation. That is the statement that this coupling here, this coupling G, is smaller than the other energy scales in the problem, say this epsilon here or the scales that are involved in this H. When this is true, yeah, when we have a small coupling, then we are always in the position of doing a kind of perturbative second order perturbation theory approach, and that is uh, what, uh, what actually leads to, to the structure here. And that one is using that the bath is unaffected by the system when the coupling is weak. The next approximation that is used is the reason why this is an equation which is local in time. So this is rho of t here, and on that side here we only see rho of t. So there's no memory back into the past. This is this Markov property, and what is used physically here is that is that the system evolution takes place on scales much slower than the temporal changes in the bath. So that, that is what makes this system Markovian, and you can see it in this equation by the fact that only rho of t occurs, but no memory back into the past beyond this uh, linear, beyond this time derivative. Okay, and then there's an approximation called rotating wave. That's essentially selecting the energies in the bath that you're talking to. I think we can leave this out. And just to be here, again, pretty concrete, uh, let's look 
at the example of the two-level system and make this connection, yeah, what is what in this bulky equation here. In that case, the Hamiltonian is really just um, this one here. Here you see the excited state is detuned from, um, shows this detuning scale omega, uh, delta here. The transition between excited and ground state go via the scales omega here. And the Lindblad operator that describes the decay from the excited to the ground state is just this operator here, excited connected, map, maps any excited input to the ground state here, and that, or, or a sigma minus operator, that's the Lindblad operator for that case. Okay, then there is an alternative way of thinking about this equation. then um, <laughs> you, you would run into a highly non-Markovian situation yeah? and you could not, um, you, you would not be able to, to justify this equation, which is really Markovian, yeah? which is local in time. Well, then, you have to, then you have to approach the problem completely differently. Yeah? You have to approach the problem from scratch in the path integral approach. This is called this Feynman-Vernon uh, influence functional approach where you don't make any assumption on the f rapidity or the fast scale bath versus system. You can still, when this bath is still a quadratic variable, you can still integrate it out. But in this resulting functional integral, you will then see that there's highly non-local correlations in time. Yeah? Already on the level of the microscopic action which emerges after integrating out the bath. But that's the answer. So, so it's not, we could not then, we should not start then in this operatorial language. In the Keldish path integral, it's actually possible from scratch. I'm just taking here this route. So this is an excellent description for many, very many systems. It's still much more general than just looking at a Hamiltonian system alone. So I want to start from this operator language that maybe people are a bit more familiar with and then map it to the Keldish. But you can also start from, Skeldish, from scratch with this, yeah? and then you, you could even describe baths, which are much more general in the sense that you mentioned. Further questions? Yeah. If we have strong system bath coupling, then I mean, this is a bit more, I mean, so the bath remains somehow um, I think there, there, there's no specifically interesting effect. Yeah? So it is, it is mainly a technical. So when this, again, in this Keldish path <laughs> integral, you could integrate it out uh, immediately. Yeah, so mainly you're using it to, I mean, to, to, to say that the bath is much bigger than the system. And that is, is I mean, technically, you can use this to, to, to claim that the, this second order perturbative approach in the operator formalism that the bath is unchanged, yeah, and therefore you can use it as, I mean, as you do second order perturbation theory. Yeah, you expand around the problem, which is only perturbed. Yeah. No, there's no real, it's, it, I mean, there's not really virtual states, I would, I would claim, um, because it is a quadratic theory integrated out, I mean, the quadratic theory for the bath so it's all what is called tree level, so there's no virtual processes involved. Yeah. Okay, good, yeah? yeah. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. The, uh, and the, the smallness that we, that we use, I mean, here is the small g. The weak system bath coupling. So this is really the coupling yeah, that, that, that measures how strongly is the system coupled to the bath. And when, when this is small, we can say this, the, the bath remains uh, unperturbed uh, by, by interacting with the system. But it's really a picture that, I mean, the system gets a lot of change by infinitely the many degrees of freedom of the bath, but the system does not feed back onto the bath. Right? I mean, it's like if you have a huge ball that's rolling and you 
throw a little ball to it, yeah, this huge ball will not uh, feel it much, but the small one gets an order one change, and that's, that's the spirit. Yeah? So this big ball has many, infinitely many more degrees of freedom, and that's kind of the, the thing that we're using. Yeah? HSB is the perturbation yeah, in, in which we do the second order perturbation theory. So in other words, you can say that um, the, uh, the ga gamma i is quadratic in uh, G mu. So in a sum over all the G mu's. That's, that's, that's what, so, so that's the structure of the second order perturbation theory. Yeah. You can also see the structure of the, that it is second order effect. Yeah? So that here you see it occurring linearly, the L's, yeah? and up there, L is coming in all possibilities of distributing it to the left and right of the dense. So that's again the structure of a second order perturbation theory, and the, the gamma I will be quadratic in the sum over the G mu's. Okay? Good. I see we, we are on a very good track. We are going very slowly. So I encourage really questions. That's really the point. Yeah? Better understanding something really, then having a lot of stuff. And ah, that, I mean, that's a kind of um, assumption. Yeah? So that's a form that one claims for the bath. Yeah? Um, sometimes if, for example, this L is Hermitian, yeah? it can be happening that this L is Hermitian, then you can leave away these daggers here. Then we would couple directly to, say, B dagger plus B, or B dagger minus B times I, yeah? so X or P components, that's just, I mean, it's a generic form. It's nothing totally fundamental. Conversely, what I can tell you, of course, if we would assume there's a, it's quadratic in these B variables, then you could not easily integrate it out anymore. So it's a technical convenience, but on the other hand, this is a very prominent situation, yeah? so that, that occurs, and now I want to come to this other way of looking at the problem, yeah? which is actually not based on, on this idea, and that might help you to, to see why this was a good model. Namely, I claim we can argue for that equation here based on a few very fundamental principles of quantum mechanics. Yeah? And that, is, um, that was the approach that Lindblad took. Yeah? He looked at um, the Lindbladian as, a, as emerging in the temporal continuum limit of a dynamical map. Yeah, so what is a dynamical map? It is just a prescription that takes your density matrix at time point t to a later time point um, t plus delta t, and it gives us the action. There is some transformation of the state exerted by an operator hat L here. And now we can uh, look in the quantum mechanics book. What do we require? from such a dynamical map to obey. Of course, for one thing is the density matrix is Hermitian, and that must be preserved under the dynamical map. Yeah? And that you can easily verify yeah, for our specific Lindbladian here yeah, by saying, okay, so by just checking this condition. That guarantees that the Lindblad, that the row after the map is again Hermitian. The second requirement is what is referred to as complete positivity Maybe we keep it at the level of positivity here. So that means that uh, if rho has positive or non-negative eigenvalues as an emission operator at time point t, we require that at time point t plus delta t, it remains a non-negative operator, meaning non-negative eigenvalues of it. And then um, we have as a third requirement a very fundamental symmetry of nature, namely the preservation of probability. Yeah? And how do we express the preservation of probability in a um, density matrix formulation? We require that the norm of the state, rho of t, does not change in the course of time. Yeah? And that is uh, ensured, and keep this in mind here, that is uh, ensured here by the cyclic invariance um, of the trace operation here. You can see if I take the trace of this whole object here, yeah, I can permute these operators through in a way that they just um, cancel out. And that, that in, in a, maybe I do this little 
simple calculation here. Um, it's particular this structure here. Um, let's look specifically at this Lindblad operator for a single Lindbladian. So this um, let's go L rho minus. I'm leaving away the hats now for saving a bit of breath. Yeah. So now you can use the cyclic invariance minus. And again, to see this is zero. And this is how you can remember the signs and factors here. Yeah, so that you should remember these uh, signs here, they really ensure the preservation of, of, um, of trace here, of probability, physically speaking. And the statement that Lindblad could show is that up to a unitary transformation that acts in the space of these indices i here, um, this is really, this L of rho is the most, this L of rho that is written up here is the most general operator that you can find which is compatible with these three requirements. So here you see, we didn't know, use here uh, a specific form of the bath. We just said, okay, we want a time local, yeah? so this is, I mean, an infinitesimal limit delta t to zero, a time local operator that acts with these constraints here and that already spits out this form of the Lindblad operator. You mean why you can pull out the delta t? Right, I mean, so one is expanding here in the, I mean, so now I'm using already this, this time continuum limit, yeah? so I should have noted that I'm using the time continuum limit. Yeah? So then I, I looked at, right, I, I look at this here and I apply the trace operation then to that side and then follows the, the little calculation we did here for the Hamiltonian, it's really this commutator structure is also traceless, right? This is this thing you, we use in the time continuum limit. Yeah, that, that's right, I should have, should have noted that. Yeah. I mean, on the other hand, I mean, of course, I mean, if, if we use this form here, it's actually not, I mean, so you see then that also the trace of this guy vanishes, so we have that the trace of rho of t is the same as the trace of rho plus, t of plus delta t. Do you see that? So, and then, I mean, so for an any arbitrary L uh, rho, sorry, delta t, yeah, where, I mean, we use that L has this structure here. Yeah? But there is not, there is no strong assumption on, on this in the continuum of the tracelessness of this L operator. Hmm? Okay. Further questions? Okay. Good. So let's now, I mean, it's a bulky object. Let's now interpret this a little more. And, um, the interpretation can go as follows. Yeah? So we have here these two terms with the minus signs. I can pull them together with a Hamiltonian with an imaginary contribution. Yeah? So I just I square is minus one. And um, I can pull together, I can construct here a kind of non-Hamitian Hamiltonian, yeah? which means energy minus uh, decay. So this is what often is also referred to as dissipation. And that is not enough. Yeah? Nature doesn't allow non-Hermitian Hamiltonians standing around uh, without further ado. Namely, we have to preserve trace of the problem. So we need this additional term here. And that is also often referred to as fluctuation. Yeah? So this is a statement you may have encountered also if you discuss uh, Langevin equations or something like that. Yeah? So that a dissipation in a physical system must always be accompanied with a fluctuation, and that is exactly what this Lindblad equation tells you here. Yeah? So we can have this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian here as a piece, but um, then it must be accompanied with um, fluctuation to preserve um, energy. Yet, I mean, it gives you a nice picture yeah, if you think of, of just friction, yeah? so there's energy and there's decay. Yeah? You can ask the question why 
do we sometimes, yeah, if we think about a pendulum, a damped harmonic oscillator, why don't we need the fluctuation there? It's everyday observation, right? That a pendulum damps. Any suggestion? Hmm? Sorry? Yeah. yeah. My claim is there's even fluctuations in that ca in that case, but there's a huge separation of scales. Yeah? The strength of the fluctuation is K Boltzmann times temperature. K Boltzmann is for statistical physics what H bar is for quantum physics. K, K Boltzmann is 10 to the minus 23. KB times temperature is also order 10 to the minus 23. And if I look at the macroscopic pendulum, the fluctuations are just totally negligible. That's where you can have a non-hermitian, but then you're on a, from a fundamental point of view, we are then violating probability conservation. It just doesn't show up yeah, because uh, KBT is such a small quantity. Yeah, well, I mean, the point is <laughs> these guys, they are not very much constrained. Yeah? So they can be, the LIs are free to choose. I'm not even requiring them to be emission operators or so. You can think the other way around. Yeah? So, so that is the most general thing I can write. Yeah? I allow, all, L is a function yeah, of the um, microscopic A and A dagger operators that span your Hilbert space in which the dynamics is going on. Yeah? but I allow arbitrary functions L of these operators. And so there is actually no constraint. Yeah? H has a constraint. H has to be Hermitian. Otherwise, yeah, so then we would not fulfill trace uh, preservation here. But the Ls are arbitrary. So it's really the statement one has to appreciate that, yeah? so that, that this form is the most general that can happen. And it's a non-trivial statement that you have to prove, but it, it's actually not except for the complete positivity that I'm sweeping a bit under the cut. It's a pretty straightforward proof. So you can look it up in the Nielsen and Zhuang book, for example. It's a st statement, one starts from this map for, for discrete time steps, and then one, one uh, approximates you know, the, the temporal continuum limit. One can approximate this. And then this is, this is what is coming out. One, one starts from what is known as uh, completely um, positive, uh, nah, what is that called? I mean, the sum of A dagger A has to be unity. Yeah, so <laughs> and then you approximate it. I, we can discuss this later on, if you like. Yeah. But there's absolutely no constraints on these else. Yeah. Other questions? Very good point, very good point. So it's actually not so obviously visible here. Yeah. So. Um, you can say, okay, if, I, if these Ls, for example, are realized by just uh, creation operators, a dagger, yeah? so then there must be something that pumps particles into the system. Yeah? So that is an obvious way of seeing that it's driven. We'll get to know, to understand why this is driven from a symmetry perspective in this Keldish path integral. Yeah? Okay, good. So um, we are at this point here. We have... Um, the argued for this uh, Lindblad equation. And I mean, the typical way how this is, um, when this is written down, yeah, is in quantum optical systems which dispose of a few degrees of freedom. Yeah? And now we want to look at a situation where these, f where these few degrees of freedom typical of quantum optics are really replaced by a huge number of degrees of freedom. Say, imagine this here is really the index that is labeling the sites in a lattice, in a huge lattice, optical lattice or whatever. Yeah? So, and then we are brought to this interface of quantum optics and many body physics, yeah, where the ingredient from quantum optics is that the coherent dynamics yeah, in, in, in described by this and the driven dissipative dynamics, they really occur on an equal footing. If you neglect one of these pieces, okay, it's, it's gone. The, the physics is, is not properly described. But on the other hand, we also have the ingredient of a typical many-body situation that, in that we have a continuum of spatial degrees of freedom. Yeah? And this 
combination yeah, of on the microphysical level, we describe it in terms of such an equation here, but we have the spatial continuum of degrees of freedom allows us or requires us to do the interpolation from micro to macrophysics, but of course we have to, so, so this is realm of statistical mechanics then, I would say, or quantum statistical mechanics out of equilibrium, which, however, I mean, requires us to develop some new theoretical tools to do that. Before doing so, a brief, um, a very brief highlighting of the possible platforms where such physics actually occurs, where this, what we just discussed, is a good description for the microscopic system. And that is here a platform of, of atoms. Yeah? So it's atoms, light, and solids. Yeah? All these uh, type of condensed matter platforms have examples for that. In the context of atoms, one beautiful example is this um, driven open Dicke model, yeah? which emerges as an effective Lindbladian description of a Bose-Einstein condensate that is um, put, that entire Bose-Einstein condensate is confined to such an optical cavity and then one drives this cavity, and the interaction of light and matter gives rise to the macroscopic occupation not only of a single mode, as you have it in usual Bose condensites, but actually two macroscopic modes. And it has been seen that these modes interact with the light exactly in this way, as does um, a, a collective spin degree of uh, freedom in a Dicke model without going into the details, and this Dicke model is, of course, intrinsically open yeah, because, um, yeah, so the light can get lost via the mirrors of the cavity, which never, in real life, never are perfect. Uh, a similar situation is um, these micro-cavity arrays here. So here you can confine light into microwave resonators, and this light is confined, but it still can hop, quantum mechanically tunnel between the resonators you can make them interact via what is known as Kerr nonlinearities, and then you realize a driven open variant of the Bose Hubbard model. It's easy to imagine that, again, in this setup as well, light easily gets lost through these maybe imperfect uh, resonators here. So you have to pump it to get a many body uh, stationary state. And also in solids, this is a platform I won't touch now. We will discuss this a little later. Um, semiconductor heterostructures, exciton polariton condensate, as they are called. So that's a solid state platform. And another beautiful example from, from atoms is, uh, for example, Rydberg gases uh, that, uh, that are used, uh, that are operated in a highly dissipative regime. Yeah. And also more recently, I mean, th systems move into the focus which are even more, th their microscopic physics is even more engineered to the point as in these platforms here. Yeah, so here you have a real solid state system here. You don't have perfect control of the microscopic physics. In all these platforms here, like the superconducting circuits, Rydberg tweezers or trapped ions, you really control particles, the microscopic constituents on the single particle level. Yeah? And um, you can do fancy stuff with these, yeah, like, uh, cooling into the ground state of a toric code or so, for example, in or complex uh, spin models here. Um, and uh, of course, I mean, also these systems are not perfect and decoherences, dissipative processes are important. They are going into the many body regime. So we also classify them in these driven open many body systems. Okay, and from a theory perspective, yeah, we want to understand yeah, whether on that uh, transition here from micro to macrophysics, there's any interesting new universal phenomena that um, maybe that cannot occur in thermodynamic equilibrium. But to do so, we really have to first forge a bit the tools in the absence of a concept like minimization of free energy. Yeah? So this is gone. In the moment that we break the detailed balance, we need to something more general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is, uh, <laughs> there is two statements that you can make. Yeah? So in, partial, in, in the very first place, yeah, so usually you want to engineer, especially in, in quantum problems, you want to engineer a perfect Hamiltonian dynamics, and then it's just the inability of 
a real world experiments yeah, to perfectly isolate from the environment. Yeah? So this is one source of uh, this dissipation and that's called noise. Yeah? So it can be electrical stray fields, say, in these superconducting circuits. So then it comes just as a nuisance. More recently, people have also um, understood, yeah, so that, I mean, one point that I was mentioning, mentioning there is no second law of, thermo, of second law of thermodynamics, so in principle, you can not only have decoherence, yeah, there's also the possibility for syncoherence. Yeah? So you can, there's nothing fundamental, yeah? so you can have fridges in the classical world, so you can also have fridges in the quantum world, where you extract energy, uh, entropy from the system, so you, your density matrix becomes more and more pure by suitably engineering your dissipation. Yeah? So there's also beautiful experiments that are doing that. Yeah? So then dissipation is not really a nuisance, it's even a resource. Yeah? But all of this is described in this Lindbladian framework. Yeah? So these are the two answers that, that I, I think one, one can give. Yeah. More questions? Okay, good. Right, so let, he, let me put here a model that <laughs> Looks bulky, and, but it will occur a few times in these lectures. So now this is an important slide. And I, I would refer to this as Lindblad 5-4 theory. Yeah? So if you do a quantum field theory course, also you learn phi to the 4 theory as the paradigm and yeah, the workhorse model to do your first Feynman diagrams and so on and so forth. So let's write a 5 fourth Lindblad. Yeah? And that is this problem here. So we have here a Hamiltonian, yeah, which describes the dynamics in a many-body system now. And in this many-body system, we have a kinetic energy, yeah, so this Laplace operator. We have a, a rotating frame. Let me call this neutrally rotating frame. And we have some elastic collisions, yeah, some two-particle processes. Particles get annihilated, and they get um, created again. Yeah, so two annihilation, two creation operators in this scattering, elastic scattering process. Then we ramp up now our dissipator here that, that enters the Lindblad operator. And the first contribution that we want to describe is a single particle pump. I was already referring to that. So that's a system where you can see here a particle at position x gets created. Yeah, we hammer this operator on the density matrix and the particle gets created. And this can occur at every position x in the system. So we have to sum over all these possibilities. We have also a single particle loss here built in. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying this must always be like that, but let's look at this 5 fourth. Yeah, and then we also want a quartic term, yeah, so something fourth order in the operators here in the dissipative uh, sector. Yeah, so we want, we describe this by two particle loss processes. Yeah, so you can see here at this point x, yeah, two particles at, are lost in, in, in the same instant of time. What's the basic physics of this complicated looking model? Yeah, it really looks complicated, but I give you a very simple intuition. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So this is, <laughs> this is the following assumption. I was saying it implicitly, so I, I only came to <laughs> if the question comes. Yeah. Imagine I have lattice sites. Yeah? And then I um, have the idea of this limp, as I was saying, yeah? at the idea, if you want to derive this, is at every lattice site, I have an infinite amount of past degrees of freedom. Yeah? Important, important point. Yeah? So how is this compatible? Well, that's fine, yeah? If the wavelength yeah, that comes out here, that is emitted into the bath, is much, much smaller then the distance between these sites, then although I have coupled the entire lattice system to a single physical bath, it looks like uncorrelated bathes because the emissions here, they see destructive interference. Yeah? So the mathematical description of independent and infinitely large bathes for such a lattice system is fine. Next thing, first statement, statement number two, now we are coarse graining our resolution over many lattice sites that gives me in the continuum limit this spatial x. Yeah? But that is, the, I mean, there's a few steps, I mean, <laughs> that, I, that I bar out here. Okay, good. So, more question, yeah? Oh. 
we, we can't. I mean, just writing something generic. Yeah? So like a phi-4 theory in quantum field theory, if you start with that, you can write a spin or quantum gravity, <laughs> whatever. Um, but if you want to develop the first steps, you start with kinetic energy, potential energy by scattering so that it's not totally boring, not a Gaussian problem. Yeah, and that's, that's a reason. Yeah? So it's just natural. Yeah? We're thinking about non-relativistic particles in a condensed matter environment. Then the leading term you can write is a kinetic energy, which is a Laplacian, assuming there's a spatial inversion symmetry. So no direction preferred, then we would have to add a, a linear gradient. H is a many-body system which you can read off from the fact that we sum over all positions x. Yeah? So this is many degrees of freedom on living on a continuum in space. Right? Okay, and so is the Lindbladian. Yeah? So this is a huge system. Yeah? It's a exponentially uh, living in an exponentially large Fox space. Yeah? That's what this described here. Okay. Oh. I think I wanted to say something about the, <laughs> the rough physics of this problem here. Yes, so to extract the rough physics, let's do something very simple. Let's do what is known as mean field theory. So we study the evolution of the field annihilation operator. We could also take the creation operator. So this is this described by the trace of this operator with rho of t. Yeah? And then we take as a mean field ansatz, yeah, we factorize the density matrix over space. Yeah, so that's a str strong assumption, yeah, but let's do something simple yeah, to see qualitatively the physics. Yeah. And moreover, we say, okay, and on every of these sites in space, we assume that the system is in a coherent state. So these are massive assumptions, but it's not so bad sometimes for, this, for these problems in the right regime. And then we even make our life simpler by saying, okay, we, we forget about the spatial dependence. <laughs> yeah, so it can't get much simpler, but what you can out, get out then yeah, is an evolution equation for just this field expectation value psi, which then under this assumption only depends on t, and that's governed by this non-linear equation here, which is a, oops, uh, no, 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 a non-linear equation which, ha which, um, which has a picture in terms of a potential landscape, and this equation describes damping in a potential landscape in such a quartic potential here. So what this problem, it's an overdamped motion in a quartic potential landscape, so in the regime where the pumping rate exceeds the loss rate of the problem, so we pump more particles than we lose, yeah? so then we destabilize the minimum where the field expectation value would vanish. And instead, yeah, it is stabilized then by the two-body loss. Yeah, we get stabilized by the two-body loss. We get a finite expectation value yeah, which settles spontaneously in one of the possible degenerate directions in this uh, uh, sombrero um, landscape here. And um, that is what we call spontaneous symmetry breaking. So upshot of this, yeah, this nonlinear complicated quantum master equation here operated in the right regime and, and under certain strong assumptions yeah, gives us a spontaneous symmetry breaking and describes the condensation of this um, field amplitude or the field expectation value phi of t. Yeah. Also a very good point. Yeah? So um, you're not forgiving me anything here. Here you see I, I wrote imaginary part of V, yeah? where V is actually this equation. I want to write it like that. Yeah? So and this V as a complex function, as you point out. Yeah? And uh, the state is fixed by the imaginary part. Yeah? The physics of this is that the 
damping yeah, will fix where, what's the size of this condensation amplitude. That's the imaginary part. And then the real part is slaved on that. I insert the solution for the value of uh, psi, absolute value, into the real part, and then I will solve this equation by adjusting this rotating frame parameter in mu. This is still a free parameter, very good point. So that's why I don't refer to it as a chemical potential, because it's actually, in this dynamical system, really much more a rotating frame that adjusts to find the solution for the real part. Okay, right, now we will translate this into a Keldish path integral, and then go through a few of the structural properties I was already uh, announcing. So this Keldish path integral first point will be a construction of this. Yeah? So maybe one, I, I'll keep it very short, but why, why would you even uh, do this? Yeah? Why would you uh, change gears? We have a description of these systems. Yeah? Nice microscopic description in terms of this quantum master equation. I can only argue here with the words of Feynman, the inventor of the original path integral idea, the formulation that we are going to develop here is mathematically equivalent to the more usual formulation. There are, however, there, therefore, no fundamentally new results. However, there is a pleasure in recognizing old things from a new point of view, that's certainly true. And also, there are problems for which this new point of view offers distinct advantages. Yeah? So what could these advantages really be? Yeah. So first of all, I think, I mean, this, this is a prophetic paper here that, I mean, has proven that uh, it has just proven that path integrals are the language for describing systems with many degrees of freedom. If you want to do actual calculations, there have been these techniques, diagrammatic techniques, collective variables are easy to introduce, randomization group concepts, very important if you want to zoom out from the microscopic to the macroscopic scale. All this is not possible from my understanding in the second quantized operator formulation. And specifically to this Keldish path integral, I mean, what I would advocate is that it's much, much closer to real-time formulation of quantum mechanics. Yeah? So then, for example, also then compared to equilibrium imaginary time path integrals, it can give us really a view of thinking about these systems yeah, by, by thinking in this language. And in particular, it opens up also the toolbox yeah, that I want to demonstrate later on of, of, of quantum field theory for these driven open systems. Okay, so here is now the um, core uh, developments. Yeah? I do this in the form of an onion. Yeah? We'll go here very quickly through the concept steps. Then the next layer of the onion, I will describe these steps in a little more detail. And finally, I will do one calculation of the simple most system in some real detail. Yeah? So here, please just follow the logic first. Yeah. Logic goes in three steps. So we start here, or think of, remember, Schrödinger equation. We start from evolving a state vector. Yeah? So this is uh, the Schrödinger equation here, and we can write it either in a differential form or in an integral form, yeah? where we use the exponentiated Hamiltonian operator. Yeah? So the same logic or can be applied to what is known as the Heisenberg von Neumann equation. Recall, this is the part when we leave out the dissipation, then this is actually the density matrix evolution here. And it is equivalent to the Schrödinger equation if rho is in a pure state. Yeah? So because then I can, these two branches here described by this commutator, they're just separable. Yeah? So the state rho is separable when it is pure and then we can map it back to the Schrödinger equation and its conjugate equation, of course. But for general density metrics, which are not of this form mixed states, then this is the right way of, of describing uh, quantum mechanical evolution. What is shared with the Schrödinger equation, of course, that it's a linear equation, linear in psi. This is linear in rho, and so we can also pass from the differential form to the integral form over here. Yeah? So, and it's just really, I mean, applying the same unitary on both sides of the density matrix. The key point that I want to make here that will explain you why we need uh, the Keldish, the structure of the Keldish path integral 
is um, that the difference here is we are evolving a com an object with a single index, psi, a vector, and here we are evolving a matrix, so we need two branches, if you like. The same structure is actually obeyed, as we, as we already said in some sense, yeah, by the Lindblad equation. Yeah? It's again a structure where we have a left and right action of some operator on the object rho, it is still a linear equation in rho, yeah? and because it is linear, yeah, we can, at least formally, we can find a solution by exponentiating something. Yeah? So now we have to declare, and I'll do it on the next slides in some more detail, we have to declare how this object acts, but it's definitely a structure that's still linear in rho, and we can find an exponentiated version of this what is called here super operator. Super just means action from both sides onto row. Yeah? So we, we'll see what, what, what this, how this can be given meaning. Yeah? But this so far for the very basic structure. Okay, let's use these three points to learn bit by bit yeah, the meat of this construction. And the first point is I want to refresh your memory on the functional integral idea itself. Yeah? So how do we construct a path or functional integral for vector evolution of the Schrödinger equation? Well, we have one time string yeah, that's running out here, and this time string describes the action of the unitary operator here, and what we then do to derive a path integral is to chop the evolution into small pieces yeah, with the reason that we can then linearize this exponential yeah, after in, in each little of these little time steps, yeah, where this delta t in the limit n to infinity goes to zero. And um, then we can act with the uh, ingredients of the Hamiltonian operator onto uh, the insertions that we put in here, and we choose them to be coherent states. So coherent states are a crucial concept here yeah, to derive the path integral. The coherent states have these bosons have the property that the annihilation operator acts as a number on these states as a complex number. They have this normalization here, and they have this completeness uh, relation that's displayed down here. So these are the three key um, properties of the coherent states. In particular, we'll insert this resolution of identity after every of these little time steps. So now let's look at a single of these time steps. And here, I want you only to Refresh your memory, hope you've seen that somehow before. Yeah? We'll, we'll do this for the Lindblad in, in more detail here. I just want to do, observe the structure. The structure is this. Yeah? So on this link, or on this insertion, I insert yeah, this resolution labeled with an index n yeah, for time step number n. Yeah? And I also write, I don't write the integral, but I write this e to the minus factor here. Then comes the action of the unitary, yeah, constrained to this little time step, and then comes already the next insertion of time step with time step n plus one. And what happens, yeah, really just watch the structure here, what happens is that this matrix element here, yeah, I can evaluate it yeah, using the smallness of the time step, and I can see that the Hamiltonian operator reduces to a functional, or to a complex valued Hamiltonian function. Yeah, so with this much more similar to a classical Hamiltonian here. It's just no longer operators, it's just complex numbers that, are, that this Hamiltonian is a function of. And by these overlaps, yeah, of that we, th there's also a time derivative structure. We'll do this in more detail. Yeah? And then if you do many steps, where well, we just have to take the product of all these elements, and then we get this object called action. Yeah? So no worries, if it's just a structure. Yeah? But I hope it generates an expectation how this has to look like when we do the same idea for the Lindblad. Okay, the operator H in this process is reduced to complex time-dependent functional FH of these complex valued fields, phi. Good, the next step, yeah, now we have to, we, we, we just dealt with this vector evolution, yeah, in single time direction. Now we want to look at the density matrix evolution. Yeah? So we have to not work with not only a single time string yeah, that's going out for a vector, we have to work with two time strings yeah, that are sorting out of the two indices of this density matrix row. 
And in the case of this Heisenberg for Norman equation, it's really just the operator u and on the other side u dagger. Yeah? And we take again this decomposition and then have the exact same idea. Now we have to insert this resolution of identity on both of these time strings. Okay? So we get here two sets of degrees of freedom for the matrix evolution. And then the identical program can be done for this Leoville generator or Lindblad generator here when we take into account, now we give meaning to this object here. The meaning of this is, okay, let's define it via its little time steps. Yeah? So let's define it as the action in, on a small time step of L on row naught. Yeah? So the first step will give us row one. And then we have this row one and we apply the next dynamical map onto this one. Yeah? So we iterate out yeah? and graphically this means we are going from uh, the center here, yeah, we, are, we are mapping out all the little steps, yeah, so we can treat this problem exactly in this uh, path integral uh, language idea. Yeah? So using the definition of this um, exponentiated Liouville operator or Lindblad operator in terms of this representation here, yeah, which becomes exact when n goes to infinity, we understand that we have exactly the same structure as we had it for the von Neumann equation. Yeah? And now, um, the last step that we still have to do is, is of this graphical structure. So if we look at these two time strings that are sorting out, now we want to construct something like a partition function. So this partition function is the trace of rho. So if I have a matrix index i and a matrix index j here, the trace means to some set equal i and j and sum over this. Yeah? Graphically, this means I knot together these two uh, branches, and that gives me then the structure of this closed Keldish contour time pass here, where um, we are starting here at row initial, uh, and then we are taking an endpoint, we take this in infinity, and that's where we take the trace, so we, uh, we weave these guys together here, and that gives me a closed time path, as it's called, and often one refers to one of these branches as the plus contour and the other as the minus contour. And of course, yeah, so that's a statement I like to emphasize, yeah, so we are representing the number one in one of the most complicated ways you might have seen, but I guarantee that this will allow us to extract very useful information by asking, by interrogating the system yeah, at any time on this time string, we can insert now operators. Yeah? And in this way, we can generate correlation functions, and that's how we then uh, extract information from this unity, mm -hmm. from this trivial factor. Okay, so now let's do a little calculation for this precisely um, uh, for the, the Lindblad operator itself. Uh, and to this end, we take a very, very simple example, yeah, the simple most uh, that, that I can imagine, and that is uh, really the, um, the single degree of freedom, a damped uh, quantum harmonic oscillator with a scale omega naught, yeah, so that's the oscillation frequency, and a kappa rate, a damping rate of this single bosonic oscillator. You can think of it as a cavity, as we've seen that, as a micro a cavity um, system, yeah, which is a bosonic uh, quantized photon mode, and this can decay with rate kappa, and we will use this formula that rho of t can be chopped up into many of these small time steps. Yeah? And what I want to do now is to compute the uh, single time step update on the density matrix at time n, yeah, which we have represented yeah, uh, with uh, these coherent states. So now, Let's write this down. So we take time step Tn, which is an initial point times n times the small time step delta T, and rho n is just um, rho of Tn. So set everything, and now we represent this matrix, density matrix at point n in terms of coherent states. So how do we do that? We write here, follow this picture here, minus n, 
Okay, this minus just tracks on which side of the density matrix we are. Like this. And the same on this tracking the other. So then I don't like to write it like that. I just write it a little differently to isolate, so to say, the, the indices of this matrix. Yeah? And I just pull out, this is a number here, so I can write it like that. Yeah? So these are now really the indices that this big matrix has. Yeah? And I have represented this thing in terms of coherent states. And now, to be really accurate, we have to still, I mean, use the resolution of identity here. So, and this is the product sigma is plus or minus, where I integrate over d sigma n star d sigma n. This is just this. Yeah? So we are integrating. So this is this formula of uh, coherent state integration now with these two indices plus and minus. And here I must not forget the normalization factor, which I can write in this way. Sum over sigma is really a small sum, yeah? plus and minus. Good. And this is our matrix element, yeah? so that we want to now evaluate. Yeah? So, oh, no, not, that's not quite right. We want to morph this matrix element into the next time bin, n plus 1. Yeah? Find, now, the goal, row n plus 1, which is the matrix element phi plus n plus 1. Density matrix time step n plus 1. So this is the really the non-trivial update on the state that we have to do yeah, in this representation of row n, yeah, this coherent state representation, and phi minus plus 1. Okay, that's now the goal. And um, let's now look yeah, what, how we can construct this matrix element yeah, for the density matrix at step time step n plus 1. To this end, we have to apply once 1 plus DTL. So the matrix element that we are constructing here involves, yeah, where I mean I, I forget about these prefactors, just not to, just to save a bit. Um, writing phi plus n plus 1. And then comes the action of unity that's written up there phi plus n plus 1 times application of L, which acts now on these guys here. Phi plus n and then we close the matrix element here. Ah, and I want to keep memory yeah, of the insertions n. Okay. So, and then comes the calculation. So we have here, we just can evaluate these, these first uh, sandwiches. It's very easy plus n plus 1 phi minus n phi minus n plus 1 plus, now comes the little time step, delta t times and now phi plus n plus 1. Now, this Lindblad operator has, as we said, it has a pure um, right action component, which is minus i omega naught a dagger a. Yeah, look at this Hamiltonian up there. Minus gamma a dagger a. That's a piece coming from this Lindbladian. Or did I call it kappa? Kappa is gamma. Yeah? So I, I take gamma. Doesn't matter. And then this is folded together with plus n. Phi minus n. Like this, yeah. So this is the pure action of, of the terms that come 
from the left. Then we have a term where there's no action on the plus contour. which comes here, remind the commutator, I omega naught, A dagger A, okay, I leave away the minus gamma A dagger A, by minus N plus one. And I have also, we have this term, this, uh, prob this uh, fluctuation term, yeah, where we have left and right action of the A operators up there. This comes with this factor of two, and it looks like that, A annihilation, this is this guy, okay? And now we um, can use the coherent state property yeah, to reduce these operators here to um, fields, yeah, so that's where we use the coherent state property, and you can see this guy, yeah, I can act to the, the, to the um, right in order to, to reduce the operator to a number, complex number, and the dagger operator using the bra cat and the adjoint relation, I operate it on that side, so here we get phi plus n, and here we get phi plus n plus one. Now let's go through all these steps here. So the same, obviously, here. Here, the same with a plus is replaced to minus. And in this term here, we get phi um, minus n. I have to act it on that side, while this here goes to phi plus n. And this is a, yeah, um, star. Like that, okay. And now, we can um, collect these things together. I bring a little bit of order into this problem. I write it as, um, I use one plus delta x, something small, yeah, which is controlled by the smallness of delta t is e to the delta x. To write this as e delta t, and then um, I phi plus n star minus phi. Delta T, yeah, so the local one in N that comes from the normalization factors here, and these guys here, they overlap to this factor here when I complete it. Um, from, the property, from the overlap of the coherent states. That's this term, and then I get the same plus and minus exchanged, which reads in detail like that, phi minus star minus n, n plus one over delta t, so you can see I pulled out a delta t, and then minus i, I square, I write minus one as minus i squared, cannot phi, so yeah, and, and, and that, okay, let me, this, where? That's everything, all the terms that I, I collect together here. And let me write the, maybe the final result. When we take now the limit delta t going to zero, such that you can see that in this limit we produce here a derivative with respect to dt. And then the final result is, the, and, and so there's two points. Yeah? So this becomes a derivative and also we can use, yeah, because there's a pre-multiplying factor delta t, here in we have contributions that are not exactly local in time, yeah? so they involve steps n and n plus one, but since they are pre-multiplied by a smallness factor delta t, we can approximate them as time local, yeah? because we're only taking linear terms in delta t into account, okay? So that is why, yeah, so, while this is here all not exactly local in time, in the limit delta t to zero, we approximate this in, yeah? Uh, 
The sign is different, yes. You <laughs> can do the calculation, yes. So the sign is different. Um, yeah. So this is because uh, these matrix elements here, they come in, in um, the, the non-local ones, they come in conjugated ways. Yeah? So the local term has the same sign, but the, the not exactly local, the one connecting n and n plus 1, this comes in the opposite way. Yeah? So that's the reason why they come exactly with the opposite sign, and it's important. And so here, yes, we have e to the i. Let's put it there in the delta t goes to the dt to an in infinitesimal increment minus i dt phi star on plus. Now you see something that looks more really like a field theory. Minus i phi minus star minus minus i times, and now I fix all the i's, or I hope so, omega naught phi plus phi plus star minus omega naught. Yeah. Here, this minus sign reflects the commutator structure of the Hamiltonian term. Yeah. And this is the left action, or the action, well, that acts to the right on, on, uh, on the density matrix. This is the right action term. So this is this one is the second, and this is the first one. And now I'm doing the same for all the other guys. So now I'm sorry to be a bit messy, but I would like to fit it into this line. Namely, if we collect everything together, we get 2 times gamma, phi plus phi minus star. Yeah, so this comes technically from this left and right action terms, and it describes the fluctuation term in this path integral language, minus with a factor of 1. Um, yeah, so the gamma is, I can pull it out, phi plus star phi plus minus phi minus star phi minus this. And that was a huge bracket over there for the exponential. So that is now the result. And um, well, if we take many time steps, well then, I mean, we just multiply now all these matrix elements together. And that gives us really the structure of an action, yeah? many time steps. We get, by multiplying these exponential factors together, we get a sum in the exponent, ex exponent and a sum over these dt's or delta t's. No matter, yeah, that morphs into an integral dt. So this is a typical, an action is an integral, time integral over a Lagrangian function. And we take this from t initial to minus infinity yeah, to sample the whole time interval, and this here to plus infinity, the final time. And in particular, if you are about signs, yeah, to write the action in a neater form, yeah, we can, under such an, inter an integral from minus to plus infinity, we can use partial integration to write this as minus um, dti. Plus, yeah? So, and then, then you, you, you produce the form of the action that I'll display on the, on the next slide. Yeah? I'll summarize this again. So these are the details of the calculation. And the next thing is I want to, to summarize this, this discussion again. So that That's right, yeah. But I'm using the... the I'm using this property only for the plus term. So I want to, you'll see it on the next slide. There's now a little glitch. Yeah? We are now here, many steps in the temporal continuum limit. I want to add one more detail before summarizing, and that is the following thing. Yeah? I've said we did this construction now for a single degree of freedom, yeah? which is even a free degree of freedom, not, no interactions. And now you can say, but this, we want to do many body physics. Yeah? So do we have... Uh, are we in the position of fulfilling this promise? My statement is yes. And so the key step is really how to operate, how to proceed on the time domain. Yeah? This is the quantum mechanical evolution. And at this moment, if you like, we have this formulation. We have a single degree f for freedom phi, where this index is plus or minus, depending on the branch of this contour. And we have a single temporal integration. So this is what you would refer to as a zero plus one dimensional field theory 
quantum field theory description or a quantum mechanics problem. Now we can have many degrees of freedom sitting on a lattice. Yeah? So then I have an additional index i, which however really runs from one to infinity. We have an extended system. And the uh, integration over time is supplemented by a summation over all these uh, spatial indices. And if we want to describe a many body problem in the continuum, well, this lattice index yeah, morphs into a continuum spatial index. The time integration goes into a time and space integration, and we end up with a d plus one dimensional quantum field theory description of the problem. Yeah? So, and this works analogously, so the, the, the writing it down can be done for interacting system, whether you can still solve it then is a different story. And I just, we leave out a few subtleties here. Yeah, there is a subtlety when we have nonlinear operators L, but I can't cover this. Yeah, so this can be fixed by a time splitting prescription. It's a regularization issue. And for fermions, yeah, mind that it's not the correct action when if you want to write fermions because there's additional signs due to the fermionic structure of the, of the problem. So, but here is the summary, discarding now these subtleties. We have started now yeah, from the Lindblad equation, yeah, which is characterized by left and right action of operators, but linearly on the density matrix. We have transformed this problem into an equivalent, yeah, no approximation made, just a rewriting into this Keldish functional integral here, where the structure of the action that emerges is written down here. Now you can check again the signs. So the relative signs, this, the, you see the, the, how to remember that. I mean, the IDT is Hermitian. Yeah? IDT is a Hermitian operator. Yeah? So, and then um, if you evolve, so it's U and U dagger. Yeah? So that comes with a relative minus. Yeah? So, but actually, that's, it's an anti-Hermitian operator because there is an I overall. Yeah? So, so an anti-Hermitian, so the I transforms to minus I. So that's, that's how you can remember that. And I, check that, that this is the right way, so. Good, and, and, and then the key structure is, yeah, so the Lindblad, yeah, so the Hamiltonian commutator that we have up there, really the rule is extremely simple, yeah, when the dust has settled. This goes into a Hamiltonian functional of fields H, which only depend, yeah, on, on the plus or a minus field. So that's the notation here. H plus means it depends only on fields phi plus, yeah, and same for minus. And now you can see also how the, this structure up here imprints in the field theory language. Yeah? Left and right action go into contour and index. Yeah? So we need to remember somehow, does it come from the left? Does it come from the right? This is remembered by adding the index in the field theory. Yeah? So like you remember a spin degree of freedom. Yeah? And, um, you recognize really this Lindblad structure here. Now, now unfortunately, I have uh, put here one half and here a one, yeah, so while in, in the other formula, sorry, I had two and one, yeah, but this is trace preserving, that's the key point. And you have this uh, rule, yeah, so that we need. Yeah? And, and what we have done on top of it, yeah, so this step, I left it out, we have taken the trace and um, identified the indices to close this, this Keldish contour. Okay. So, um, maybe I would like to do a little bit of this still before tomorrow. So, um, we have a few structural properties yeah, so that I would like to discuss. Yeah, so, and that will teach you a bit how um, fluctuations are treated in this uh, functional integral. And I, I hope you can, if you've heard about functional integrals, yeah, so then I think this, this will make a nice connection and otherwise you you have to learn on top now how this functional integral works. Yeah? So, <laughs> but, but it's really the same way as a standard functional integral works with a few, from my view, interesting special features. Yeah? So in particular, for these structural properties, I want to discuss three points. Yeah? First of all, how is this fundamental property of probability conservation reflected in this functional integral language. And we've seen, I mean, probability conservation in quantum mechanics, in pure state quantum mechanics, you would replace this probability conservation by unitarity of quantum mechanics. Yeah, so it's a very deep symmetry principle of nature. So how is this seen in the um, Keldish functional integral? And then 
we, so this can be seen as the absolutely trivial most approximation that you can do for this Keldish action. Yeah? And then comes a little bit better. Yeah? It's a kind of first order approximation. Gives us what, is, what we can understand as a deterministic limit. Yeah? So it's like the super classical limit where the whole functional integral which sums yeah, by virtue of this summation here, yeah, which comes really from all these coherent state insertion, the product over these, we can still do an approximation, yeah, at least formally, which singles, which approximates this whole sum by a single configuration, the one that minimizes the classical action. So how is that coming out of this Keldish path integral? And finally, of course, I want to explain you how we can integrate fluctuations in this, in this problem. Okay, so this probability conservation is sometimes also referred to as causality for reasons I think people didn't know a better word. But uh, I would rather term this uh, probability conservation. Yeah? So this is the property of the Lindbladian that um, trace of rho has no time evolution. In the Keldish path integral, this is the statement that a trace of rho is normalized for all times. Yeah? So we always produce with this Keldish partition function the number one. Okay, and what I want to now argue yeah, is essentially that this Keldish action has a very special property that other field theories do not have, and which is the property that if I val evaluate the um, fields at identical configurations on the left and on the right contour, then this is precisely the property that ensures probability conservation. And, so, and this is a very special property of Keldish actions. Yeah, if you take a an action, an imaginary time action functional integral, you look at the action, you insert a specific configuration, you get a, some number. But uh, for this Keldish action, if you identify the configurations on left and right side, then we get zero. So how do, does, why is this reflecting probability uh, conservation? This is due to um, a nice redundancy that this Keldish, uh, that, that actually we have due to cyclic invariance of the trace. And this redundancy is, is written down here. The operator expectation value for any operator, I can write it like this, operator on the left, or by using cyclicity, operator acting on the right. Right? Now, when we translate this into a path integral, this means that I cannot distinguish yeah, whether I insert the operator right before I take the trace at time t yeah, on the left or on the right. Yeah. This is precisely in the operator language cyclicity of the trace means in the Keldish language that I can insert operators either on the plus or on the minus contour and the result cannot change. Yeah. That is not physical information whether I insert on left or right. Something one should appreciate. And that means in immediately that if I look at um, the time evolution of Z, so, so that will be the result. Let's look at the time evolution of Z for, for the fun of it. When I look at the time evolution of Z, yeah, you can see um, in, in the action, yeah, the action now runs up till time T, and I write it as a kind of time integral over a Lagrangian small s. Yeah. Now, if the time differentiation at the endpoint in time t acts on this time up here. So it spits out just this Lagrangian function down there. Yeah. And if I evaluate this, um, this uh, Keldish, um, th this Lagrangian for equal arguments, yeah, then precisely by this formula, you can, you can see it here. If I evaluate this formula, I say now phi plus equals phi minus, yeah? So then this here cancels with this one, and this is also, or, or phi plus, phi plus, yeah? So all these terms here cancel out, yeah? So indeed, if I identify these um, two contours, then I get a zero for this uh, dissipative part, and same thing here, yeah? If I identify phi plus, phi minus, these guys will just cancel out, yeah? And it's precisely this property of the Keldish action that, I mean, if, if we insert here, oh, this is now zero, as we observe, yeah? So then we see, indeed, uh -huh, this is the probability conservation reflected 
in the Keldish path integral. So this is, I mean, upshot of this discussion, very simple. Yeah. If you look at the action at equal, uh, at equal arguments, yeah, if I, we identify field configurations on left and right, then you can see explicitly, no, nah, it doesn't work, that, that um, the action vanishes, and here we have the interpretation of this vanishing of the action as a probability conservation of the problem. Okay, so the last thing, and then tomorrow uh, we go on with, um, with fluctuations. Um, ah, the last one, one thing that, um, that I would like to motivate yeah, is that this uh, property of the Keldish action motivates something that is known as Keldish rotation. Namely, you can pick much more clever coordinates for these fields. Yeah, and if you read in books on Keldish, you will see this immediately. Now, this is how we rationalize this. So um, we can make the probability conservation for which we argued now much more handy. Yeah? So the starting point is that we have um, these fields on the plus and minus contours. And we understand now, yeah, or we have seen that if we evaluate them at equal arguments, yeah, so then this implements probability conservation. Now we propose to do a rotation of these fields. We, we switch the coordinates of this problem. And we switch them into center of mass. Yeah? So we look at the sum of these guys and relative coordinates. Yeah? And with this trick, yeah, we then produce the property, which is a bit more easy to, to handle. Yeah? The, the action evaluated for any configuration of this, of this center of mass coordinate, this one, for any configuration. But for this relative coordinate evaluated at zero, which means identifying the two configurations, yeah, must spit out this zero. So this is how, in this new basis for the field variables, we represent uh, the probability conservation. And the interpretation of this is the following. Yeah? So they are called, C is called, referred to as classical field, Q as quantum field. This terminology has nothing to do with entanglement or so, it's just related to this following thing here. The classical field can acquire an expectation value. Yeah? So this is the field that can describe condensation and spontaneous symmetry breaking. Yeah? So as you know, in many body physics, you've heard this yesterday in Norm's lecture, condensation yeah, is a physical phenomenon that we will see in this classical field expectation value. Yeah? While the quantum field, yeah, by this redundancy, yeah, so one of possible choices for an operator is the field operator itself, and we've just seen there's this redundancy in description that tells us that these expectation values don't see the value of this plus or minus, yeah, so therefore, the quantum field can never acquire a field expectation value. Yeah, so by, by this redundancy of the Keldish path integral, and that's why it's called quantum field, yeah, so the the classical field describes possibly condensation phenomena. The quantum field expectation value is always tied to be zero. So this looks maybe a bit like a technical detail, and in fact it is. Yeah. However, I'm emphasizing it because in any book, when you look at Keldish, you will most usually find this choice of basis here because it's much better for practical calculations. And that I wanted to motivate that physically that it is a beautiful, handy implementation of this probability preservation property that the Keldish path integral has. Okay? So we end on this technical note, and tomorrow we go on and uh, flesh out the merits of this uh, quite tedious calculation. <laughs> Thank you, and see you tomorrow. <laughs> and of course, if you, if you have questions, just uh, ask them now, or you can come, come to me. So. Any more questions for today? Yeah. Thank you.